Now that's the great Cornell West, and let me tell you, it's not a good time to preach after Cornell West. <laughs> but it is an amazing where lecture that he gave in 2015 to thousands of Unitarian Universalists. He said things that were important. He says, unequivocally, I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. He says, any serious talk about the struggle for freedom and struggle for justice has to radically call into question any conception of ourselves being self-made. We didn't give birth to ourselves, he says. Somebody had to inject some kind of love into us. I have a question for Cornell West this morning, and that is, why do you begin a lecture on activism like that? Why do you begin it with that kind of message? Why do you begin it by emphasizing unequivocally that we didn't give birth to ourselves? And I think I know the answer. Because of the way the activism story is usually told. It is usually told from an individualistic angle, not a relational one. And this insight came to me about 12 years ago when I was serving a congregation in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and I heard the news that the great Rosa Parks had died. I opened up the Fort Worth Star Telegram to read the tribute to her entitled One Person. And it went like this, until December 1955, a soft-spoken department store seamstress could not have imagined being placed at the forefront of any movement. Rosa Parks, who died Monday at age 92, was destined to become known as the mother of the civil rights movement after refusing to give up her seat to a white man on a Montgomery, Alabama bus. Her simple but very brave act would lead to a 13-month boycott of the bus company, a Supreme Court decision barring segregation of the public transit system, and the identification of a new national leader, Martin Luther King Jr. She was, continues the article, the spark that invited, that, that ignited the nonviolent revolution that quickly began burning through the thickets of segregation and Jim Crow laws that had been in existence for almost 100 years. That was the tribute. Now, before I say anything else, I want to bow to Rosa Parks. Don't we want to bow to Rosa Parks? We want more Rosa Parks. In this world. I hope that's not, that's not the controversial part of my sermon, by the way, so I'm just, just, I'm just joking. We want more Rosa Parks in this world. What is troubling, though, is the way that the Fort Worth Star-Telegram tells the story in such individualistic ways. The title is one person. The title itself telegraphs that individualism, one person taking on the entire world. One person acting alone, seemingly coming out of nowhere. No mention of her ties to any larger supportive community. No mention of her part in an existing broader effort which trained her, an activist like her, in what to do and what to say should X happen or Y or Z. Nothing at all hinted in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram story about all the worship services or the prayer meetings or the hymn sings that she would go to because she needed encouragement. She needed inspiration. Nothing at all suggested about all the committee meetings. <laughs> I heard groaning in your souls. Oh, all the committee meetings, late night stuff, bad coffee coordinating meetings, coalition building, strategizing, small gains, setbacks, nothing at all about anxiety, uncertainty, and all the mistakes, all the mistakes. No, now, no one is, was asking the Fort Worth Star-Telegram to like write a complete Rosa Parks biography. I was not asking for that, but to fail to mention any of the ways that her activism was relational was and is only to reinforce the destructive impression that love and justice activism requires someone who is almost morally superhuman, which immediately disqualifies me, and maybe you too. Or maybe, maybe not, I'm gonna look for some halos out there, some Jesus halos. Got 
Let me see. Are there any? Oh, no, too bad. None out there. The message is only perfect people need apply. And that is why Cornell West starts his talk about activism by saying, somebody loved me. I'm an activist. We are activists because somebody loved us. And maybe that somebody was blood kin, family you were born into, like, like Chris Crass, our speaker from last week. He talked about how he grew up hearing his father say horrible, hateful things about people of color, but he also saw his mother pushing back. His mother pushed back, and this went a long way in leading him today to fight racism. Maybe your story is like his. Or maybe you had only one parent, and that parent read you stories about caring for the earth. And as often as possible, he or she would take you into untamed natural places. And you just sat and soak, and you absorb, and you felt the spirit there. That is why today you honor the planet, and you recycle, and you do whatever you need to do to combat climate change, however you're going to do that. Maybe that's your story. Maybe, maybe it was someone in Rosa Parks' family who loved her. And it's part of why she became the person that she did. I, I don't know about that. What I do know is that parenting and grandparenting and step-parenting and any and all of the ways of influence and education happening in one's families are powerful forms of relational activism. You teach a growing person to love what is right and they live always in that light. And as I say this, I feel some sadness because it wasn't like that for me. And maybe that's true of you as well. In my own case, a memory stands clear. It is the mid-1970s. I'm living with my mom and dad and two brothers in Peace River, Alberta. That is way north of here. That's 300 miles south of the Northwest Territories. Just like way like that, in that direction. It was a region that, like the rest of Canada, had been stolen from First Nations tribes. Now, where I lived, the Cree Nation had originally been plentiful, but contact and conflict with white people over land rights and religious identity had decimated them. You know, when Cree people speak about themselves in their own language, they call themselves true people. But I saw something troubling one day with my family. We were entering like our favorite restaurant in the town, a Chinese restaurant called the McNamara Cafe. I know, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm just realizing that 50 years later. That's a, whatever, okay, so we were entering into the McNamara Cafe, downtown Peace River, and I saw a true person near the entranceway he was sprawled out on the ground. I saw his long hair. It was tangled. His, his dirty clothes, ha his half covering, his, his snoring face. I smelled a pungent smell on him. He was stained, disheveled. Why was that? I had never seen that before. I asked my parents, what happened? I asked them, is he okay? And they clucked their tongues, and he said, they said he was drunk, and they hurried me into the restaurant. In other words, out of sight, out of mind, right? It could have been a mini truth and reconciliation moment where I was led into the insight that a true man, a true man and his, his nation had been hurt by the same historical laws and social arrangements that had benefited my family and me. It could have been a mini transformation moment where I learned that people who suffer in your community, they may be out of sight, but can never be out of mind, not just, be, not just because their pain is unacceptable to a truly good human being, but also because any society that creates such intense pain in some of its members can be counted on to twist up and distort the humanity of all of its members. No one is untouched by the evil, the need for truth and reconciliation, the need for transformation, the need to become fully human by engaging in love and justice activism. It would not emerge for me from my family. 
And we were, in truth, too wrapped up in my mother's mental illness to have bandwidth for anything else. We were just wrapped up in that. But I am here today to say, even so, somebody loved me. Somebody loved me. And that love, that somebody, it took the form of a friend. He was probably the first out gay man I had ever met when I was 30 years old. I had grown up sheltered. I had grown up in conservative communities. That changed. I met him, and we have loved each other like brothers for years. I am fierce for LGBTQ justice, not just because it is right, but because I know his life, and I know his dreams. And if God hates him, well, God better hate me. Somebody loved me into the activism that I do. Now, do you have somebody like this? Not a family member, but a friend or a teacher. Someone who, like Cornell West, has injected love inside of you. Do you have someone like that? Yeah. And then there is the somebody who loves us that is a community. You know, I was there at the Justice General Assembly in 2012. We heard Taryn talk about that a moment ago. It was just as she says. We did. I saw it. We rode up there in school buses. General Assembly organizers making sure there was an ambassador in every bus would answer questions, lead us in song. I was singing. I was singing as well. Let our little light shine one more step. I was there. I remember. I remember our UUA president standing up giving a rally and crying. He was there with the president of the, of, the, of the United Church of Christ and those folks were there. We were there together. We were united in our message that what we saw before us was wrong. Tent city was wrong. Abuses were happening there. We need to do something about it. We need to put our bodies and our voices on the line. We need to use our power to stop these injustices. I was there at that moment when the lights in the tent city, flickered on and off. And those people in captivity, they knew we were there. We were there for them. They did not feel alone. And I felt loved by my Unitarian Universalism. That's what it feels like to be Unitarian Universalists, loving us into our activism. You know, it led our congregation, this congregation, to vote in May of 2016 to affirm our anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism resolution. Moments before that vote, some of you were here, moments before that vote, it felt, it felt like we were standing at the precipice, just like that poem, standing at the precipice, arms locked together like a tandem skydivers working up the courage to jump. And then we were asking ourselves, what have we got to lose? A poverty of the spirit, the lie that we are alone? We jumped together, we jumped. Unitarian Universalism loved us into that. We jumped because somebody loved us. And we have jumped. We have marched. We have studied together. We have worshipped together. We have reminded each other that we can be like Wonder Woman in our lives. Remember? We have, we have reminded ourselves that we can be both compassionate and strong. We have said to each other, look into the future. How will you be remembered? And we must continue jumping. We must continue asking, what have we got to lose? A poverty of the spirit? The lie that we are alone? We must do this because these days we are encountering the biggest challenge there is to relational activism, and that is pushing back against what is wrong without pushing people away. To actively resist injustice because to stay neutral now. To stay neutral means you side with the injustice, right? Do you get that? But to do all of this in a way that stays humanly connected with the people who want you to stay neutral. They don't want you speaking up. But you must speak up. But you also don't want them out of your life. Do you see how big a challenge this is? Do you know this challenge? Do you know it? I know it. I am struggling with it. You hear the struggle in my sermons. 
I was in Canada a couple weeks back. And when I was in Canada, I bought myself Justin Trudeau socks. <laughs> Justin Trudeau, just beautiful. He's a beautiful world leader. Yeah, he's handsome too, but he's just beautiful, right? So there are Justin Trudeau socks, and I'm just like, I don't even wanna know how much those are. Here's my credit card. The only thing I can say for myself is I did not literally take my pants, my, excuse me, my shoes off and my socks off and put them on right there. I didn't do that, so I showed some restraint. And then I thought, I'm not gonna be in Canada that long. I'm gonna be coming back home, coming back home to what we have now. And I was sad unto despair. I will never buy Donald J. Trump socks. <laughs> Never, never. But I and we, we got to find a way to live in the same country as him and the people who voted for him. Some of those people might be us. Definitely there are family members and friends of ours who did. Moving forward, I want to pledge myself more deeply to the humanistic essence of our Unitarian Universalist faith that affirms with the ancient playwright Terence that I am a human being. Nothing human can be alien to me. So, when I encounter a point of view that says, build a wall, I'm going to resist that 100% of the time. But I need to do it in a way, in a spirit that affirms that the build a wall perspective is not alien. What were the life experiences that make building a wall reasonable to this person? What are the issues that deeply concern them? What is the fear that is at the root of it? What is happening? Relational activism affirms that no matter what the perspective is, underneath is a human being trying to make sense of their experiences and their fears, not a devil, not something inhuman. This is true of us all. Unitarian Universalism loves us in our humanity, and it means that it is loving us into treating others humanely. Even if we resist what those others believe with fierceness, no one has to be perfect to do the work of love and justice activism. The way forward is unpredictable. It is two steps forward. It is three steps back. It is five steps forward. It is 10 steps back. It is 20 steps forward. And yet we walk together. We never stop because somebody loved us. <laughs>